a very warm welcome to this uh, conversation, this ChemSec conversation that we're having for the very first time, where we're sitting down with someone in the chemical space that we think it's worth talking a little bit extra to. Uh, my name is Peter Piero, and I'm uh, from ChemSec, the NGO ChemSec. And with me here, I have my colleague, Dr. Anna Lenquist. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. I'm happy to have you here with me. I'm happy to be here. Yeah. And also with us here is uh, uh, Professor Bethany Carney Almroth. Uh, so uh, we have two titles here today, and I'm the average guy. Um, and we, you are here because you uh, have written a study that have, has gotten a lot of traction in the recent weeks. Uh, and it's called Outside the Safe Operating Space of the Planetary Boundary for Novel Entities. A very long academic title. Yes. Yeah. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, and um, why uh, people are talking about it, basically. But first, like, can you just give me kind of like the elevated pitch for, for your study? You know, if you just have two minutes and uh, you want to tell someone what's a, what, what it is about, okay. can you do that? I'm going to start with saying what the planetary boundaries are. Yeah. And that's a framework that was written first in 2009 by a group in Stockholm that tried to understand how humans were affecting Earth systems, the function of the planet. And in doing that, they identified nine different categories that our activities were affecting and that in doing so, potentially destabilizing how the planet works. And, in the, and then as a consequence of that, making it a less predictable and less safe place for humans. Uh, they had looked at a number of these different categories over the years and tried to quantify those to see like how far we've pushed beyond what the planet can tolerate. But one of those that had not yet been identified is the novel entities, which is what we worked with. Novel entities is all the new stuff. It's chemicals, it's plastics, it's things that humans have made and released into the planet that did not exist before we made them. So we tried to understand uh, how much has been produced, how that is affecting the planet, and try to determine whether or not all of these chemicals and plastics and novel entities are, in fact, destabilizing Earth's systems. So, like, in other words, the novel entities, is that just another word for, for chemicals, more or less? Or? Yeah, yeah, so it, it, can a few, it can include a few different things. It's, the word novel means new, yeah. and entities, things. Thanks for that. Yeah. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. new things. Yeah. And it's, uh, it, we focused on chemicals and plastics, but if you were to expand that a bit, you could also look at, uh, and in the definition uh, of that term is also included uh, modified organisms. So, the genetically modified organisms mm -hmm. is one thing, and also, and natural substances that have that we have affected to change where and how they are and f an example of that would be metals so metals are natural they're elements but the way they exist on the planet now where they are and the forms they're in is very unnatural mm -hmm. so those are also included there but we focused on synthetic chemicals so man-made chemicals and plastics because mm. when i started to work on chemicals uh, the planetary boundary concept was discussed a lot mm. uh, especially for climate change maybe and then it was said that uh, it's not possible to establish a planetary boundary for chemicals because there are so many and they are working in so many different ways. So uh, when I saw this paper, my first question was, of course, like, how could you do this? That's, <laughs> that's a good question. And that's, that's something that we spent the first few weeks of this process discussing, like, how are we going to do this? Mm. Because if you, just, if you only focus on chemicals and plastics and ignore all, the, all of the other things that might be included here, it's still 350,000 different things that we're talking about. Mm. And, and there's so many knowledge gaps. We don't know enough, really, about every single one to start to doing like, these kinds of assessments for every but, single one. But can I just stop you? So mm -hmm. in plastics, there are 350,000 different chemicals. Or is it 350 chemicals in total, you would say, roughly, in, in circulation? Uh, yeah, so for chemicals, about 350,000 chemicals. Yeah. We can discuss whether or not a plastic is a chemical. That yeah. can be a very academic discussion. But we are including plastics as a chemical in, in that they're a synthetic material. They're made of human-made molecules. Oh, okay. And plastics themselves can contain up to maybe 10,000 chemicals. Some studies show a new report came out recently showing uh, chemicals in f food packaging materials, and they found 55,000 different substances there. They were not able to identify what they all are. Mm -hmm. But it, it's big numbers we're talking about. But can, can I, I mean, for someone who doesn't really understand chemicals, why do we have so many synthetic chemicals in circulation? Do we really need 350,000 chemicals? Why can't we just have 20 or 30? What, 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 why are they all there? 
Why are they all there? Do you know, do you know the answer to that, Anna? Because I don't. Why do we have so many chemicals? Why do we have so many chemicals? And uh, no, I, I suppose that's because nobody said that we could not have so many chemicals. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, but they, I mean, they must fulfill some kind of function, or yeah. I don't think that all of the three hundred and fifty thousand um, are fulfilling a function yet. They yeah. have maybe just been uh, produced in the lab, mm. but we know that around 40,000 chemicals are registered under REACH. I'm, not, I'm a bit uncertain on the, about that figure, but they have a, are at least then produced in uh, more than one ton mm -hmm. and definitely used on the market. Um, and there has been, many people are asking themselves why, why we have so many chemicals, but that, because that definitely complex things. Mm. And so there was also a recent paper this autumn um, trying to launch the concept of, of chemical simplification. So sort of could we, uh, go, move down from these 350 and, and uh, sort of establish the ones we would really need and get rid of the rest in order to to have better control of the ones we choose to have sort of. Mm -hmm. But to, I mean that would require uh, a global system change of how we regulate things and how we I think it's a, that would need a revolution mm -hmm. almost to... I think we do need a revolution, I think that's what we're calling for now. Yeah. But, but I mean, okay, so let's say you, you look then at 350,000 chemicals and we know you, there are so many unknowns about mm -hmm. w with these 350 chemicals. We don't really know the effects of all of them and even the volumes of them are unknown. So how do, can you establish with so many unknowns that you actually cross a, a planetary boundary uh, yeah. when it comes to chemicals? Uh, good question. And as I said, we had a lot of discussions about this in the beginning. And we were starting in the planetary boundaries framework and the other boundaries like climate and like biodiversity loss, extinction rates. A scientist could go back to the Holocene, which was the time period prior to the one we're living in now, which has been entitled the Anthropocene, and look at what did it look like then? <clears throat> so how are human activities? Is yeah, that, I mean, humans okay. existed then, but mm -hmm. human societies were not affecting the climate as much as they are now. So, of course, we always had impacts maybe on local areas, but not to the, nearly to the extent that we have it now. But the Holocene was a very stable time period, and it was a time period during which humans as a species prospered. So a scientist could look back and say, what was the temperature then? How much carbon dioxide was there then? And get a baseline, like this is what the baseline looks like. Mm. But for all of these chemicals, by definition, they didn't exist during that time period. So we couldn't use that baseline. Mm. So we had to start thinking in different ways and how can we try to get an understanding of how all of these new things might be affecting the planet and how much the planet can tolerate. Mm. So to do that, we, uh, we had a lot of discussions about what a boundary is, what a threshold is, what a baseline mm. is, and what kinds of uh, information we could put into calculating like a limit. And, and we realized that we probably couldn't do that, given mm. the fact that we're talking about 350,000 different entities and that we don't have data on nearly all of them, on very few of them, I would even say. I think that we have good toxicity data, like how, how chemicals are hazardous on a few thousand. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and a lot of that data is in single species tests, in short term experiments, using one chemical at a time. And that's not what the planet looks like. The planet is very complex with all species interacting with each other. There are hundreds and thousands of chemicals that every organism is exposed to and over very long time scales. And these are not things that we're testing for. So, so just for example, a recent study looking at 20 years of academic literature, scientific studies, found that we have a good understanding of the ecological impacts of about 65 chemicals. So 65 out of 350,000. So, okay, there's so much we don't know. So coming back mm. to the question. How do we, <laughs> how do, we do this? How do we do this? Yeah, how do we do this? Yeah. Okay, so, so we tried to get a big picture, like over over the whole production chain of, of these entities because there can be impacts along the whole way. And we started at the beginning. So what are these things made out of? They're made out of... When, when you say beginning, you mean when they are produced? Yes. Or, yeah, yeah, so kind of like uh, produced and when they are used yep. uh, in the product and when they end up in the waste uh, phase, yep. end of life. Okay. So following yeah. this sort of linear progression through materials, that's really how our societies are built, Yeah. right? So you start with extraction which for plastics is 98, 99% of the time fossil fuels. It's oil and natural gas. Uh, also true for a lot of chemicals, but there's mining activities, trying to get the raw materials to make all of these chemicals and plastics. And already there, we have problems. We have environmental damage, uh, oil spills, uh, 
extractive processes and there's damage to land systems and to, to water and so on. So there we have problems. And then if you move through this impact pathway, you come to the production uh, and factories are emitting and uh, chemicals and plastics to the air, to the water, to the soil, from there to the products, which enter a use phase. And there, this, is, this part is where people have the most knowledge because this is where the consumers have these things in their hands or they're being used in industries and it's like cars and carpets and food packaging and everything else, from there into waste. Mm. And all along this pathway, chemicals are leaching out to the environment, plastics are leaving our hands and reaching the environment. And we tried to find like, okay, what information do we have along this pathway, along this chain? And what is that information telling us? So when we move all the way to the end, which is where the planetary boundaries is important, we look at the earth system. What do we know about what these chemicals and plastics are doing in the earth system? And the first question is, are they reaching the earth system? Are they spreading throughout the planet? But what do you mean with earth the, system? How the earth, how the planet earth functions. So how, what is the temperature like? What is the climate like? Yeah, okay. Uh, how like many, the, uh, how it regulates <clears throat> itself. Or, yeah. yeah okay. uh, nutrient cycling, mm -hmm. nitrogen, phosphorus, uh, how many species there are on the planet, how many aerosols there are in the atmosphere, like all of these p pictures, pieces of the puzzle that build yeah. this, mm. that the planet functions within. So the last p piece of the puzzle is what are all of these things doing to the planet? Mm. First question, do we find these chemicals and plastics spread throughout the globe? And the answer yes. to that is yes. Mm. <laughs> yeah, definitely for plastics and for a lot of chemicals. Mm. And then what are they doing? Mm. What would your critics say? Uh, and I guess you had a lot of critics actually who, who criticized your study. And not as many as I would have expected so okay. far, but give it some time. Yeah, <laughs> then we'll come. But I think we're, we're trying to base all of our work on uh, published data mm -hmm. that's been peer reviewed, that there's some sort of quality control process. And I can, I can tell you this maybe is not evident in the paper, but in our discussions when writing the paper, we try to be very mindful of um, equity and fairness. <clears throat> the, the authors of the paper are generally from Western societies, and there's a certain way of knowledge creation in our institutions here that doesn't always mirror the way knowledge is produced in other environments. We try to be aware of when we do have knowledge about impacts around the globe, why is it those areas we're studying and who is doing that work? So we try to be inclusive and uh, encompassing and fair. Mm -hmm. Environmental justice is a very big issue that we all discussed a lot while working on this paper and try to really keep ourselves grounded in, mm -hmm. in that way of thinking. But would you say then that in, you know, industry, when they come with their studies, is it often not peer-reviewed data or they, they don't uh, include lots of these things that you just mentioned? I can't speak to their process. No. I, don't, I don't know that, but uh, their studies are not always open. Yeah. And I don't know if they have peer-reviewed. Do you know that? I, I think <coughs> it's very different. Some, some industry studies are peer-reviewed and published in sort mm -hmm. of academic journals, but, mm -hmm. not, but not at all everything. And I think it's quite rare that they do this kind of large scale analysis that you did mm -hmm. and with such a broad uh, author base from different affiliations. Mm -hmm. Different fields mm -hmm. of expertise. Yes. Mm -hmm. But then there are a lot of course of uh, industry affiliated scientists that are based at universities and, and doing some work for an industry and that's not necessarily wrong. Um, but I assume it's wrong if you, you choose to publish what, what's in favor of your, of your business mm -hmm. and you choose to not publish what might affect your business There's wrongly. There's a, a conflict of interest mm -hmm. that's yes. inherent there. But a little bit on that note, uh, was it anything that surprised you with your results? Or was this sort of according to your pre previous understanding? Mm -hmm. Well, when we started talking about how to do this work, and which kinds of data to take in. And we, as I said, we didn't have a whole picture. We had little pieces of evidence. We didn't really know what pieces of evidence we were going to take in. So we had to sort of design our framework for addressing the issue. And, and given that, I think we couldn't predict before we started where we would end up because we didn't have the process created yet. But knowing what I do know about pollution and chemicals in the environment and persistence of these molecules that are not degrading and the toxicity of of so many of them, no, I was not that surprised. Mm. Mm. No. 
But, and I, uh, you know, I like to keep my industry hat on for a little <laughs> while and uh, play that role. But uh, so we say 350,000 chemicals, right? And I mean, the argument many times that come from the industry is that it doesn't matter how many chemicals uh, there are. What matters is, uh, uh, you know, the, the dose, the, because the dose makes the poison. Mm. So uh, what would you say to that? Yeah. That's a very traditional way of looking at toxicology, mm. and it's true in many cases, but not all cases. So the dose sometimes makes the poison, but sometimes it's more important uh, when an organism is exposed, or how it's exposed, or, or in what mixtures it's exposed. Mm. So uh, an organism that's developing the, like during its uh, larval stages, or for humans, fetal stages, has very sensitive processes that are ongoing that can be affected by chemicals. That can that can uh, only be visible first upon maturity. Okay. What kind of chemicals <coughs> are we talking about? Uh, this, for ex an example, here yeah. would be hormone disruptors. Okay. So chemicals that are similar to hormones. Yeah. That can act in the same way as hormones. That can disrupt developmental processes, uh, systems like reproduction, metabolism, growth. These are all controlled by hormones, and chemicals can affect all of these systems. And they are very present in plastics? Uh, yeah. yeah. Hormone disruptors? Okay. Not only plastics, but absolutely, you find a lot of these kinds of chemicals in plastics. Yeah, okay. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Where do we go from here? <laughs> yes, about plastics. Uh, so, so you choose to... Uh, can you say that the study is using plastics as a proxy for chemical pollution in general? Or how do, how do you link the chemicals and plastics issue? Yeah. in this paper? So we, we look both at chemicals and plastics, mm. and uh, chemicals is a big word, it encompasses everything, and plastics are also considered chemicals in some cases, it's a matter of definition and we can pick these words apart. What is, what is a synthetic chemical, a semi-synthetic chemical, what is a plastic, how long is a piece of string? If we're talking mm. about polymers, and uh, I, I would consider polymers to be a, a category of chemicals. Mm. And they're they're and not polymers. Included. What what are they? Oh, polymers are the building blocks of plastics. Okay. They're chains of molecules that yeah. make plastics. But if I just were to interrupt you, uh, you know, for me or I, I say many of my friends, they consider keep plastics. That's one thing, you know, you know because you can you can touch it. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's something tangible. But a chemical is something invisible. Yeah. Uh, uh, should we treat them as one more, or is it wrong to view them as two, two separate things, or should we actually just uh, think of plastics as chemicals? Yeah, so this is another discussion that we, <laughs> we've had, and I think uh, th that plastics can be a very useful door opener for talking about chemicals because they are very tangible and you can see them, you can touch them, everyone knows what they are mm. and can understand them and can see the, the consequences in the environment. Mm. And there, the, the, there are some differences. So plastics ha have like a physical nature, as you said. So some of the damage they're causing in the environment is due to that physical nature, mm. that they can, animals can become entangled, they can have their, their gastrointestinal tracts blocked if they're eating bags, they can cause flooding, and, and so on, while chemicals are acting in, in a different way. Mm. But they still are having impacts in the environment and causing harm. So how worried are you? You said yesterday that you had a professor that just said after you presented this paper that should we just all lay down did and die now? Did you talk yesterday? Yeah, we oh, talked we yesterday. Did. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We had okay. a little preparatory wow. discussion. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's one response. Should we, like, should we just give up? Is there no hope? Should we all just lay down and die? Mm. And it, it looks a bit dark. Mm. It's, it's problematic. And, and we show that it's the predictions that exist right now for chemical production is that they will increase. Plastics production will increase. Mismanagement of waste will increase. We're going to have more releases to the environment. We're going to have more chemicals, more mm. plastics, more potential damage unless we do something now. Mm. And we do have opportunities to change this. We can demand change. We can ask for the, the handbrake to be pulled on, like grab that emergency brake and pull it and say, we're not going to accept this anymore. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. what you were saying before, maybe we can simplify chemicals. We can simplify plastics. We can put a cap on production and, and stop this. And it will require like massive changes, revolutionary mm -hmm. changes in how we make all the things we use in our lives. Mm -hmm. But I mean, so, okay, sorry, I just didn't you know what about the results. Mm. Uh, let's say you say we didn't you, get there yet. Yeah, no, <laughs> because you only skipped that. You know mm -hmm. what? What should we do? But you know, uh, yeah. what are the conclusions? So you crossed the planetary mm. boundary. Can you give me some or us some examples of why we think that? Yeah, or yeah. you know what has happened. Yeah. So mm. if we start at the beginning of this this linear line of of materials from extraction and production, the the data that we could find that we have in the paper are that 
extraction and production has been increasing for the past 20 years, for the past 100 years, and that it's predicted to increase into the future. So this is a lot of different kinds of pesticides and antibiotics and plastics and other, other chemicals, some of which are very persistent and don't break down. They're all increasing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then we have, in the next step, uh, release to the environment. There we can also see that it's in, there we have releases from chemical production sites, from plastic production sites. We have massive spills like the one off the coast of Sri Lanka this summer where uh, tons of plastics and epoxy chemicals and phenols were, were lost into the ocean and onto beaches. Mm. There we have losses. So these are like pieces of the puzzle. And if we move into effects, I mean, we know that we find chemicals and plastics on every, absolutely every environment on the planet, from the upper atmosphere to the deep oceans, in, in our blood, in our guts, then what are the effects? And some of the chemicals, we have very clear effects. Some chemicals are causing uh, like reproductive damage in humans, but also in animals in the wild. We have chemicals that are affecting antibiotic resistance and changes in like microbial communities at the base of the food chain. Mm. We have, there are connections to changes in nitrogen and phosphorus cycling, also at the base of the food chain. Chemicals and plastics are affecting biodiversity. Mm. They're intimately tied to climate change. Mm. Some people refer to plastic as, as climate change in its solid form, since they mm. are made out of fossil fuels. And in the end, if they're incinerated, are also releasing carbon dioxide. Mm. So, so all of these little pieces of the puzzle, all, that are, all the arrows are pointing in the same direction, and that is that it's too much, we have no control over it, and we're causing damage. But, but, but how do you know that, I mean, it's chemicals that are causing it, uh, because you, you don't, you cannot isolate it. I mean, we used to talk about, uh, we always love talking about sperm, don't we? Like, <laughs> <laughs> the sperm, and the sperm quality that it's declined so much uh, yeah. with, uh, with men. And uh, for me, you know, that's such a great, uh, way of communicating the problem with mm. chemicals. But it's also, uh, when you read studies, you say that it may uh, cause decline in sperm. It's very, it's not always conclusive. Yeah. Uh, so so how, uh, how do you approach that? So these studies, like the sperm studies that you're talking about, a lot of those are coming out of uh, epidemiology. And humans are very complex to study because we're complex mm. beings and you can't pour toxins on us and see what happens. Uh, ethically, morally, even though maybe that happens sometimes in <laughs> drinking water and so on. But okay, so, so doctors will take large populations of thousands or tens of thousands of people and study, for example, their chemical body burden. Take blood samples and urine samples and do chemical analyses and say, like, what does this person have in their body? And then look at health outcomes. So they do these big correlation studies, correlating the chemical body burden to the health outcome, something like decreased fertility. Mm. And correlation is correlation, so that's something that should always be uh, looked at with care. It does not prove causation. But then we have other data that can explain how that chemical might cause that health problem. And that's from in vitro tests using cell-based systems or animal experiments. And then you can start to say, okay, we see this correlation and we can understand the causation. So then we can we can say that these things are connected, that these chemicals are causing this health. Like my understanding of when you say that the, the planetary boundary is crossed is that we have this huge increase in production of chemicals and, mm. and re release of plastics to the environment and that we do not have a chance to, to catch up. So the control and regulation and knowledge is lagging so mm. much behind of what is happening. Yep. And that that is what why we can say that we that we cross the boundary because we have no opportunity to to, that, to, to follow and the evidence that does exist mm -hmm. that chemicals and plastics can be affecting ecosystems yeah. that there there is some evidence that this is happening already and mm. it's not for all 350,000 chemicals but for some of them mm. and there are sometimes laboratory based evidences that are showing that plastics are affecting ni nitrogen and phosphorus cycling Mm. Or, and, we, and we know that plastics can release carbon dioxide and we can, we can find connections to the other boundaries so that mm. these chemicals and plastics can affect planetary systems. So when, when you have, a, what difference does it make on a political level uh, to have defined this planetary boundary for chemicals and plastics, do you think? Or have yeah. you seen already that? So, so a lot of what we're talking about is things that are happening over very long time periods. And the changes that are occurring have occurred over decades and over uh, spatial scales that are beyond your backyard or your neighborhood. So I think it's very hard for an individual to get a good understanding of 
of the processes that are occurring and the impacts that are occurring. And what the planetary boundaries does is take our collected knowledge and put that into like a human scale framework that we can see, we can try to understand the, like the enormous temporal spatial scales of, of the impact of all of these entities and put it into a picture. And then we can understand that. And I think that's a very important communication tool. So it's, it's, uh, it sounds like I'm, I'm making this much smaller than it is, but it's like our collective knowledge over time and space that is put into this uh, process. Mm. But have you seen like, has the, do you think that the planetary boundary for climate change, for example, has affected the climate, the policies around climate change and the, the targets there? And do well, you think well, we can you're, expect you're that the from the... Why, yeah. why are you asking her that? <laughs> okay, I mean, so you should, you so this, is the, <laughs> this is something I've thought about, though. Because yeah. you look at these, these charts that overlay like global temperatures with the COP meetings, COP 1, 2, mm. and so on to 26. And you can see the temperature rising as we have more and more of these meetings. But mm. we don't have a control group. Mm. Right? We don't know what would have happened yeah. if we didn't have these mm. meetings. So I, I don't really know I can answer that question. I, I, I would like to see more action. Mm. But for us, I mean, that we work with chemicals every day, just like you. And mm. I, mm. I tend to think that, you know, when people look at sustainability, I saw this, um, uh, like a sketch the other day of a, a man just, you know, his vision were towards uh, uh, carbon emissions. Mm. And then it was like all these other sustainability issues, but that was just uh, in the periphery. Periphery. The periphery? Yeah, the periphery that's for a him. That's hard word. So he, yeah, so he just, he, that's the only thing he saw. Yeah. And that's so true for me uh, that I think many people, they just, you know, they just focus on carbon mm. emissions and they don't see that there are other things that are actually connected mm to the whole kind of sustainability puzzle. Yeah. Do you think you could contribute to, to connect that since, you know, I mean, plastics and oil is so connected here. Mm -hmm. Could that contribute to, you know, a wider understanding? Uh, yeah, and, and these, none of this is easy. Plastics have, have solved a lot of problems and mm. have contributed to s sustainability in some ways. Mm. So, for example, lighter vehicles and uh, longer shelf life of food when it's packaged properly. So plastic mm. has solved problems for us and helped us in some ways. And, and um, no, one, no one of us is advocating for completely banning all of these things, simplifying and, and getting a better uh, control over what's out there, but that we have to use them uh, correctly. Mm. There's, mm. So, there's so many things that we're producing that are completely useless, uh, speaking of non-essential uses, mm. that, we're, that we're beyond what, what is reasonable. But didn't you say also that COVID really is have you know speed up the use or we've, we've taken mm. a step back because of uh, you know we need to stay healthy and clean and uh, it, you know fight off germs or bacteria. Yeah. Or whatever. So that, that's another sector where plastics have been very important in the mm. medical sector for mm. healthcare. Some of it's from like personal protective gear and some of mm. it's from uh, like uh, blood bags and and syringes and blister packaging for pharmaceuticals and so on. But there's also an overuse. And th there, there were some uh, pushes during Corona to, s to roll back legislation that was already in place that was restricting plastic bags, for example, mm. out of um, fear that, that other, that, of how the virus was transmitted mm. and that plastic maybe would be a safer material. And that was done without having any evidence for the fact that it was true, for, mm. without really understanding how the virus was transmitted but purely to increase the use of plastics and to roll back legislation. So during Corona, when, when fuel prices bottomed out because we weren't flying and we weren't traveling as much, there wasn't as much demand for fuels. And, and this started happening before Corona too, but the, the fossil fuel industry has started shifting some of its production into plastics. And this is something we also touch on in the paper that we call lock-in, mm. where an extractive process is in place, like the oil drills are there and the mining is there and the fracking is there. And they have all of those infrastructures in place. If they can't put that into like fuel mm. usage, they shift it into something else. Mm. In this case, plastics, and they they will lobby very hard to make sure that this can be done. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> How to kill a conversation? <laughs> um. So all these chemicals that we have uh, in, in the plastics, uh, how are they then transferred into humans and into the wildlife or you know, animal, animals? Yeah, so for humans, uh, one of the major exposure pathways is food. So where things are either included in growing the food, if it's pesticides or fertilizers, something like this, 
or it might be in food packaging in all of the for the most part a lot of plastics but also paper materials and metals that are lined with plastic but there, there's chemicals in all of these packaging materials and they can move from the plastic into the food and this is affected by how much fat there is in the food, the pH of the food, the temperature and so on but the chemicals can move from the plastic into the food and then when we eat the food we're exposed to the chemicals so that's one route it's there's but there's chemicals in drinking water and there's chemicals in all of the personal hygiene products that we use soaps and creams in, in some of the things we're talking about are pharmaceuticals too uh, some of the chemicals are in the and air dust, we're breathing them in and, and yeah so there's through through our lungs through our stomachs through our skin all of the above mm -hmm. But, and it's uh, obviously it goes it's very slow uh, it, it doesn't happen overnight that you get sick or whatever but it's like this constant exposure day yeah. in and day out and we're I mean it's a, it sounds scary and uh, I mean that humans are increasing in uh, health and survival and so on but we're starting to see long-term effects of the low-level exposures that we're gaining. What so kind of long-term effects? Increases in non-communicable diseases like cancers and fertility problems and met metabolic problems with, associated with thyroid and uh, insulin and so on. These mm. are some, some diseases that are connected to chemical exposure. And in the, in the environment, when we're talking about organisms in the environment, they're coming into these chemicals sometimes in the same way, through contact with plastics, but the chemicals can also migrate through the environment in different ways. They might be in water, in lakes, rivers, oceans. They might be in sediment and soil bound to particles. They might be moving through food chains, so from algae to, to plankton, to fish, to whales, mm. to birds. Uh, so they're, they're moving up through food chains and they're spreading through the atmosphere. They're in the clouds, so they're, they're literally everywhere. Yeah, and I can ask you, I mean, this is to someone working in the field. What mm. Bethan is just saying, it's not really um, any news. Uh, you know, you know this, right? Yeah. And I think it's, it goes beyond you. A lot of people know this. Uh, so why aren't uh, you know uh, regulators uh, regulating this? Why, why are why is it why is it allowed to just produce these chemicals and put them out there? It's a very good question. I think this is how it has been from the start that. Uh, I mean, people start to innovate and produce and do business and, and, and then regulation comes after and tries to catch up. And uh, when, when the European chemicals regulation was in place, I mean, this was one of the main... When was that? That was uh, more than 10 years ago now, the REACH regulation, 2006. Okay. And before that, nothing uh, existed or what? Some things existed, but by that, uh, at that time it was more that if you discovered that a specific chemical did, had caused a specific problem, uh, you could set up a regulation for that one. Um, but with the REACH regulation, there was this idea that you would at least have, that all chemicals on the market would be registered. So at least that you sort of knew you would have to tell someone that you were producing something and putting something out. And for the, the ones uh, produced in the highest volumes, there is also a need for certain data uh, accompanied uh, by that. And I mean, we've had that system for about 15 years now, and I think that knowledge has improved immensely um, but but going from that to actually regulating chemicals has taken a very long time so we are still in a situation where we are regulating chemicals very much uh, one by one and for each chemical to be regulated it's required uh, enormous amounts of evidence yeah. and it's long discussions in different committees and it's taking a very long time but we are in a situation now the, where the European Union has, uh, has promised to improve things. So there is a chemical strategy in place, uh, which mentions very many of the things that we have wanted to see for a long time. Um, so, like. so it's meant to put a higher, higher bar in terms of transparency, in terms of knowledge of chemicals, that more uh, properties need to be investigated for chemicals to be put on the market, higher demands on transparency, and that uh, chemicals that we know that are classified as being hazardous of certain properties should not be allowed in consumer products more automatically than what has been done now. But, and um, that we should also look into how we can regulate chemicals more in groups, for example, and look into new concepts like that hazardous chemicals should not be allowed if they are not necessary for health or environment. So there are all those different ideas of how yeah. to improve it that is are being negotiated right now 
Um, so I think there is very many things look promising, but the negotiations are hard and there are still very many things that, that could go wrong and fall in the end and there could be all these kinds of uh, derogations and exemptions and, and loopholes uh, that, so that hazardous chemicals can still be used and produced, but I still think it will be a main difference from the situation we have now, or I hope. Well, you said it was uh, 15 years, uh, roughly, since REACH was uh, put in place, the chemical mm -hmm. legislation. Uh, how, what do you think, uh, how will the world look in, uh, in another 15 years? Yeah, these are slow processes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I hope we will have more knowledge. I hope that at least more chemicals are better regulated. But looking at, at doing another planetary boundary, I'm afraid it would look quite much the same. Because 15 years, that, that's quite a lot. I mean, I used to, I, have, I had had uh, hair 15 yeah. years ago. <laughs> <laughs> so, so a lot of things yeah, can happen. A lot of things can happen. <laughs> a lot of things can happen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Shouldn't you ask mm -hmm. for more? You know, mm -hmm. like yeah, we should years, ask for yeah. more. We should, yeah. Uh, yeah. What's your conclusion? There's, but what should be done? You know? there, so sometimes I get the question like, "What can I do?" Yeah. And I think an individual can do some small things, but these picture these problems are very systemic, and they're built into our societies and they're built into our like global commerce systems. And an individual has very little opportunity as as an individual to affect that. Mm -hmm. So I think mm -hmm. we do need higher level control over these things. So like, it's yeah. too much focus on, you know, bring your own plastic bag or, you know, what what what, what consumers can do. Yeah. Do you think that? Or should we I mean, focus more on what the industry... I think individu it's important what individuals do. Yeah. And individuals need to understand uh, what is happening and why it's happening and the changes that are to come. Mm -hmm. But one person bringing a, a, a plastic bag or a, a reusable bag to the store is not going to change the whole system. Mm. Many people doing it can have an impact. Mm. And that's what we have to sort of look for sort of collective change. And I think policy decisions are going to be needed mm. to get us there because it's, these, are, these are hard, complex questions. So, so Anna was talking about the chemical strategies, which are, when they were first presented, were like a Christmas wish list of, mm. uh, of how chemicals could be managed. It's well, a matter the, of- the EU's uh, Yeah, that's the strategy. EU. And yeah. the EU is like one region of the world. Mm. Which, which I, I think. Thank you for that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know. I know. Yeah. It's the IQ. It's, it shows some She's professor. A professor. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yep, <laughs> professor. Yeah. But that the the EU can affect other markets yeah, too yeah. because it's a, it's a, a powerful market on a global scale. But we do need to have a, a, a more global collaborations around these questions because it is a global market, and there are a lot of dialogues going on now around chemicals legislations and around plastics. There are a lot of initiatives in place now. There's some meetings coming up in the end of February, beginning of March at the United Nations Environmental Assembly to try to push for more global action around chemicals and around plastics. So mm. we're hoping that some of those will go through and then be implemented mm. in real life. In 50 years, we should have an international panel for chemicals pollution. In 50 years. In 15 years? In 15 years, absolutely. That should be in place. Maybe in one least. year. Maybe, Maybe in one, one year. year. Yeah. But uh, I want a little bit of a, like a gossip, you know. What, mm. what have been the reactions? What have been the pushback for the report? Have you had any hard words? So, for the most part, it's been overwhelmingly positive. Yeah, okay. And I think this is this is really interesting because I've been talking about uh, plastics for for a lot of years. I've been doing this research for a while, and chemicals. Um, I try to weave chemicals into all of my narratives because they are so inherent to plastics and, and to environmental health and human health, but they're harder to talk about and people are a bit maybe more resistant to talk about chemicals. They're hard to pronounce and they're invisible, as you said mm. earlier. Mm. But now I think we're talking about chemicals in, in a different way. And there have been little stories coming out maybe over the years about like BPA, or which is used in plastics or PFAS, these sorts of Teflon pan kinds of stories. But now I think this paper helped push this question out to the front of the media and has reached really wide audiences. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it's been shared a lot in a lot of different media outlets across the globe. It's been, it was trending on Reddit. Yeah, wow. Yeah, I, know. It was kind of, I, don't, I don't even really know what that means, but I think it's a cool thing. Yeah, but, but it feels, I mean, it's, because Reddit, I mean, obviously it holds a lot of uh, different subjects, but still, you know, to trend there, I, I mean, that's... Yeah, uh, and I've understood that a lot of uh, politicians have been favorable of the report, yeah. if you can mm -hmm. judge their favorability by their 
retweeting things. I don't know if that counts. Yeah. But there's been a lot of positive responses and there's been a lot of reactions and a lot of people are talking about these things, mm -hmm. which hasn't been the case as much in the past. So that mm -hmm. is really positive. And those discussions are going on everywhere from like gamers, and I know this from my nephews, up to, <laughs> up to United Nations preparatory meetings for, for the upcoming assembly. So but why, why do yeah. you think that is? I mean, because the report, let's be honest, is not very sexy in, in the title, it's very academic. So mm -hmm. how, uh, w what is it that made this report uh, fly better than previous ones? Well, I think the planetary boundaries framework itself is yeah. very visual and very easy to understand. Mm -hmm. And while the report itself is heavy to read and it's very academic, we did we put a lot of effort into communicating about the report. So we made some nice press releases. We reached out to a lot of different uh, different groups that can help us spread the word mm -hmm. and try to like translate our scientific findings into a message that had meaning for the broader audience. And I think we succeeded in that, which mm -hmm. I'm very happy about. Mm -hmm. Then there's always a little bit of pushback from uh, nefarious actors, yeah, if I can call them that. Yeah, now it comes. Yeah. And, and it's been, I mean, I could have written the script. It's mm -hmm. been these, the, exactly what I would expect them to say. Uh, chemicals are everywhere, they're all around us. Everything's made out of chemicals. Okay, mm -hmm. fine. We're not talking about natural chemicals, we're talking about synthetic chemicals. And not even all chemicals are toxic. We're talking about the toxic ones. Yeah. Mm. Then there's, uh, Scientists don't really know, understand these things. It takes an industry specialist to know what we're, we're talking about because we have all the knowledge, which maybe they do know more things than us, but a lot of times that's because they're not sharing their data with us, I would argue. Mm -hmm. Then there's the, we've been accused of not understanding regulatory mechanisms, which I think is a bit uh, problematic too. I mean, some of us mm -hmm. are more aware of these processes than others. Maybe some scientists don't work in that field at all and don't know that, but our collected knowledge of the authors on the paper have a pretty good grasp of what's going on in Europe, at least, mm. Mm. And, and at the United Nations level. What else have we heard? It, yeah, I've, I've been asked to compare bowling balls to plastic bags and, and how those are the same things. Or how can you connect? But why did you, why were you asked to compare those to a bowling ball on a plastic bag? Because you don't, maybe you don't hear a lot of reports about bowling balls killing whales. Yeah, okay. <laughs> And yeah. it's made of plastic? Uh, <laughs> I don't, know I don't even follow the thing that's <laughs> the, out there. I didn't really get it either. Uh -huh. they're, both, uh, they're both made out of different kinds of plastic resins. Uh -huh. And they have different environmental impacts over different timescales. But they're sort of part of the same big picture. Should bowlers it's, be scared? Is that what you're saying right now? No, <laughs> no. No, okay, no. no not at all. Uh -huh. and, and then, like, how can... So one of the things that we conclude in the paper is that we, we're asking for a global cap. Like maybe we just have to say like we can't we can't release more than this. Like we have to amounts of volumes and, and production of volumes. Yeah, okay, maybe yeah. numbers of chemicals. We didn't go into a lot of detail there because that's a discussion for later down the road. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But but we need more innovation. We need ways to recycle materials. We can't just continue to extract, use, and throw away yeah. mm -hmm. because there is no way, right? So we have to stop that linear process and we have to change things so we can use materials better. We can through innovation, through design, through increased transparency, reuse, recycle, and so on. That, uh, that in, in saying that, that we're uh, causing problems because this can have economic implications. And one of the questions I got was, well, if you're putting a cap on production, that might help people in, in the United States living in Cancer Alley, which is a, an area where there's a lot of petrochemical industries and there's much higher rates of cancer in the, in the regions around this area. How that might help those people, but how is it going to help someone in the Philippines living in a, a waste dump? And that, and I had to explain that these things are connected. That that, that production, increased production, will always lead to increases in waste, mm. Mm. and that needs to be managed. And right now, our waste management infrastructures are very global, mm. and a lot of the things that we produce and use here, or produce somewhere else, use here, and then throw away, are shipped internationally mm. to the global south right mm. now in a lot of cases. Uh, Anna, I mean, you, you yourself, you're an academic and you uh, exist a little bit in the interface between policy and science. Uh, so, I, I mean, I often hear you talk about that uh, scientists, they don't really think about how their science can be used for policies. Mm. Uh, but do you think, could this, uh, Bethany study here, uh, you're not alone, we, we need to mention that as well, several other brilliant people yeah, have helped you. But could it, could it be translated into like policy recommendations or, or, or is it just, is it going to stay here in the academic field? I think one, uh, one important thing is that, uh, as we said before, that so many things are happening. Uh, and there is a political will to do something about the chemical crisis. But I think that we constantly need to remind ourselves like to why, why we are doing this. 
why is it important and why is it uh, worth <laughs> all the effort, so to say, and all the costs that will come along, that it's really ha it's meaningful to continue this way and to put these regulations into place and so forth. Um, so I think, as we said before, that there's nothing really new in the paper, but it's more emphasizing uh, what many of us know, know su suspected, but it's making it in a more um, clear way that is difficult to ignore and that can uh, encourage the different processes that are ongoing and that, that those are necessary and hopefully also beyond the EU because now we've been with the policy measures we have been quite EU focused but we need to as you say go to a global scale mm -hmm. and there I think it's really important with those larger analysis yeah. and uh, I think also I mean it's been a development uh, over recent years that more and more scientists also uh, engage more in the policy developments and do these uh, like the ones you send up today like signing that we need a global treaty on plastics yeah. for example um, that scientists become more also a bit activistic in that way that you using their knowledge and say we need to do something not just presenting it and leaving it like that mm. um, and I think that's really helpful and I wish that more scientists would would do that because there are a lot of inherent problems uh, in in the interface between science and policy so as a scientist you always look at the next step and are more interested in what you don't know than what you do know mm. and you uh, you are very cautious to draw conclusions because you're very aware of the uncertainties and the limitations of your studies so therefore it can be difficult to, to sort of get scientists to actually speak up clearly about what we know um, and I think it's an important movement that more and more scientists still say that, okay, here we know enough, here we need to change something and we can sort of sign on to that. Mm. I think um, in the past also your scientific accomplishment, it, 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 um, you met the king because of that. <laughs> Will you meet the king, the Swedish king, a second time now? I don't know, he hasn't called, yeah. I'll let you know. <laughs> yeah, looking forward to that. Um, if you like what you heard here today and want us to do more interviews, you could uh, comment on this video and share it with others and let us know your thoughts. I want to say a big thanks to uh, Dr. Anna Lenkvist uh, for joining me here. And uh, also to uh, uh, Professor Bethany Carney Almroth for joining us and talking about your very interesting study. It was a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Thank you, Thank you guys. <laughs>